And we begin tonight with the House January 6th committee closing out what's likely to be its final investigative hearing, public hearing at least, with a remarkable step. One of three major developments as it seeks to wrap up its work. The first, voting unanimously to subpoena the former president and making it very clear why. He's required to answer to those police officers who put their lives and bodies on the line to defend our democracy. He's required to answer to those millions of Americans who votes he wanted to throw out as part of his scheme to remain in power. This committee will demand a full accounting to every American person of the events of January 6. So it is our obligation to seek Donald Trump's testimony. Chairman Benny Thompson made clear that Trump was the central player in not just the January 6th attack on the Capitol, but also the extensive plot to overturn the results of a free and fair election. The committee spelled out in new details its second point, that Trump's intention to steal the election was completely premeditated, citing testimony from former Trump campaign manager Brad Parscale, that he understood from as early as July of 2020 that Trump planned to declare victory even if he lost. In a draft statement prepared for Trump to read on election night, written by Tom Fitton of the right-wing group Judicial Watch, dated October 31st, declared, quote, we had an election today and I won. Again, no election had happened yet. The committee also referenced comments from two of Trump's loyal henchmen, former advisors Roger Stone and former chief strategist Steve Bannon. And what Trump's going to do is just declare victory. Right, he's going to declare victory, it, but it, that doesn't mean he's the winner. <laughs> he's just going to say he's the winner. I suspect it'll be. I really do suspect it will still be up in the air. But when that happens, the key thing to do is to claim victory. Possession is nine tenths of the law. No, we won. F- you, sorry, over. We won. Yeah. You're wrong. F- you. New evidence also showed Trump's state of mind surrounding his failed attempt to overthrow the election through meritless legal challenges, including counting on his stolen Supreme Court to be his trump card only to have his challenge to the results in battleground states rejected. The president's just raging about the decision and how it's wrong and why didn't we make more calls. And so he had said something to the effect of, I don't want people to know we lost, Mark. This is embarrassing. Figure it out. We need to figure it out. I don't want people to know that we lost. Today, even as the committee hearing was underway, the Supreme Court shut him down again rejecting his request to intervene in the court fight over classified documents seized from his Mar-a-Lago compound. But some of the most damning new information in today's hearing came from evidence about what federal law enforcement and the Secret Service knew about the threat of violence prior to the final step of the former president's scheme, the insurrection on January 6th itself, including a summary from advisors at the Department of Justice and FBI about communication saying things like invade the Capitol building and engage in political violence. Testimony from Joint Chiefs Chairman General Mark Milley showed that other agencies were also aware of the threat of violence, including a warning from a deputy defense secretary on a national security call. During these calls, I only remember in hindsight because he was almost like clairvoyant. Um, Norquist says during one of these calls, the greatest threat is a direct assault on the Capitol. I'll never forget it. And we got a fresh look at what happened when that concern came to fruition as the inflamed mob laid siege to the Capitol on the 6th in chilling new video showing the chaos that unfolded inside as congressional leaders led by House Speaker Nancy Pelosi did what Trump wouldn't do, secure the seat of our democracy, the United States Capitol. We have some senators who are still in their hideaways. They need massive personnel now. Can you get the Maryland National Guard to come too? Just pretend for a moment it was the Pentagon or the White House or some other entity that was under siege. And let me say, you can logistically get people there as you make the plan. Well, why don't you get the president to tell them to leave the Capitol, Mr. Attorney General, in your law enforcement responsibility? A public statement they should all leave. We're trying to figure out how we can get this job done today. We talked to Mitch about it earlier. They believe that uh, the House and the Senate will be able uh, to reconvene in roughly an hour. Good news. 
Joining me now is Clint Watts, MSNBC National Security Analyst, Distinguished Research Fellow at the Foreign Policy Institute and former consultant with the FBI Counterterrorism Division. And with me in the studio, Nick Ackerman, former Assistant Special Watergate Prosecutor and a former Assistant U.S. Attorney for the Southern District of New York. And Charles Coleman, Civil Rights Attorney, former Prosecutor and MSNBC Legal Analyst. I feel incredibly undereducated in this group. Everyone here has many, many, many degrees. But I, Clint, you are at a disadvantage. You're not here with us at the table. I do want to start with you. That video was about a five five-minute clip. It was really dramatic. And it showed Speaker Pelosi, it showed um, Senate Majority Leader Chuck Schumer and others sort of doing the president's job that day. In a normal situation, you'd think if, you know, history looked back on a siege of the Capitol, it would be the president making those calls. Just as, as a national security analyst and somebody who advised the FBI and worked in counterterrorism, what did you make of just that? Yeah, it's just bizarre that it's the president of the United States that's the impetus for the attack and also unresponsive in dealing with it. It's the reverse of what you would think. Yep. It, it is one of the strangest things I'm, I'm certain in American history. And I think this always goes back to over the last year when we've had hearings. Uh, it always is, why did it take so long or where was the confusion? Well, the president of the United States is in charge of the armed forces. There was not a, a lot of certainty in terms of who, who was in charge or who could get troops mobilized at the same point you saw, I, I think uh, Speaker Pelosi, you know, did an amazing job. You see her basically organizing around. And uh, honestly, when I look back at General Milley, Secretary McCarthy, a lot of the people in the Department of Defense, it's a miracle they got troops there as quickly as they did because there just was no chain of command really acting in any sizable way. You heard nothing out of the White House trying to get those people to move back from the Capitol. Uh, I, I think even now when I watch it, the, the idea that not only did they assault the Capitol, but they stayed and lingered uh, for all that time, it's just a travesty for the country. It speaks more broadly to what is leadership if you're the president of the United States and what if something else had happened? We saw a lot of chaotic uncertainty throughout the Trump administration, this being, you know, the pinnacle of it. But at many other times, uh, can you just imagine a decision-making process more chaotic, how insane it was at the White House? and just how lucky we were that we didn't have a massive national security issue that really required a, someone with temperament, someone with poise, and someone who could make a decision in a in a way that would get all of the wheels in motion. And so that clip, I think what it really shows is just how lucky we were to get through January 6th uh, with uh, even as terrible as it was, that it wasn't much worse on that day. Indeed. And, and you know, to the gentleman at the table, I mean, uh, Nick and Charles, the thing that is the most dramatic and sort of insane about it is that it was the president of the United States who was directing that attack upon his own capital and upon his own vice president. So this wasn't the president failing to do his duty right. because the attack happened. He didn't know what to do. So Nancy Pelosi had to do it. This was the president actually led the attack. I mean, yeah. you, you did. That was the plan. That he was the plan. He actually planned the attack. And so it was the rest of government attempting to organize a response to the president's attack on the Capitol. Yeah, and it also looks like the president also ignored the intelligence that came in. He purposely had to have ignored it 10 days before this attack. The Secret Service had lots of information that there was going to be violence that day at the Capitol, yet nobody did anything, which leads you to believe that somebody inside the government was putting their thumb on the scale and not permitting that information to go to the proper people so that protection could be put in place. I mean, that really deserves a very thorough investigation as to the people that received that intelligence, where it went, and why nobody did anything. I mean, and the reality is, Charles, I mean, you have Donald Trump attempting to manipulate the Department of Justice to aid in this attack. Um, he has his own people input at the Department of Defense to make this attack possible by making the National Guard unavailable and, and other things. But you also have him doing that, knowing he lost the election. Right. That was the other thing I think that was established that was really important. Let me play very quickly. This is Donald Trump's people that worked for him in the White House talking about the fact that he knew, with all this that he did, that he lost. Here it is. This is a fraud on the American public. This is an embarrassment to our country. We were getting ready to win this election Frankly, we did win this election. We want all voting to stop. So he's calling for the voting to stop, but this is what his actual White House team was saying. This is cut one for uh, my uh, director. We're in the Oval and there's a discussion going on. And the president says, 
I think it's, it could have been Pompeo, but he says words to the effect of, yeah, we lost, we need to, we need to let that issue go to the next guy, meaning President Biden. I remember maybe a week after the election was called, I popped into the Oval just to like give the president the headlines and see how he was doing. And he was looking at the TV and he said, can you believe I lost to this effing guy? Mark raised it with me on the 18th. And so following that conversation where the motorcade ride driving back to the White House, and I said, like, does the president really think that he lost? And he said, you know, a lot of times he'll tell me that he lost, but he wants to keep fighting it. And he thinks that there might be enough to overturn the election, but, you know, he, he pretty much has acknowledged that, he, that he's lost. Charles, there are people on trial right now for seditious conspiracy who are acting on his behalf. He knew he lost. Right. Is he, in your view, a seditious conspiracy, a thing he might have to deal with soon? I think the question becomes att attempt. When you look at what the January 6th committee has done, and what the responsibility of a prosecutor is to do, you are supposed to take away questions that the jury may have. Reasonable doubt is rooted in questions. If you think about what we know now that we did not know from the start of January 6th in terms of the committee and their work when these hearings began to everything that we know now, there are so many questions that have already been answered. Whereas if Donald Trump never shows up and we don't hear a word from him, if he does not comply with a subpoena, we still know that it is very clear that Donald Trump knew this was going to happen, that Donald Trump wanted this to happen, and, Donald, and that Donald Trump used his power and authority to allow it to happen. Those are the central questions that you're talking about when you're talking about sedition. The connections, those things, those have been established those links have been made. His intent, that has been clarified. So the only thing that is left right now is to see what Merrick Garland and the DOJ decide to do with the information that has come out from so many different witnesses and all pointed to the exact same place. Yeah.